Good. Well, welcome everybody and good morning. Um, gives me great pleasure this morning to welcome David Morgan Hewitt. Um, I'm sure David is well known to many of you. So just bear with me. I'm just letting a few more people in. Uh, hold on, where have they gone? Um, Right, so um, yeah, great pleasure to, to welcome David. Um, as I say, I'm sure David's well known to many of you. Um, just by way of a little bit of background, um, having graduated from Durham University in 1986 with a, a degree in, uh, David decided it would be an idea to try the public relations field. Um, but he'd always wanted to be in the hotel and restaurant industry and so very quickly realized that a career in, in PR was not for him and moved swiftly across into hospitality. Uh, after working at a couple of restaurants in London, he was offered the role of restaurant manager at the Goring Hotel back in December 1990. Since then, he has remained at the Goring for 30 years, something of a rarity in the modern world of hotel keeping. Uh, he became managing director in 2004 and has helped Jeremy Goring and the rest of the team to take the Goring on to ever greater heights than it had already achieved under the much respected hotelier George Goring. It is now fair to say that the Goring is one of the country's leading independent hotels. It is the only one with a royal warrant granted by Her Majesty the Queen back in 2013. The hotel also famously hosted Catherine Middleton the night before her wedding at Westminster Abbey to His Royal Highness Prince William. As well as his continued devotion to Goring, David is also Honorary Catering Advisor Defence, advising the Army, the RAF and the Navy on matters to do with their catering arrangements for their personnel. He is the Chairman of the Master Inholders. He sits on the Court of the Worshipful Company of Inholders is a member of the Executive Committee and Council of the Royal Warrant Holders Association and is an ambassador for English National Ballet, having chaired their gala committee for several years and raised over a million pounds for the ballet. As well as having helped the team win many accolades for the hotel, David has also personally won a Katie as Manager of the Year and recently received a second Katie for his outstanding contribution to the hospitality industry. Indeed, Luxury Travel Advisor also voted him top general manager worldwide. Um, all of these awards he accepts because of and on behalf of uh, what he describes as his amazing team who he works with at the Goring. So, David, it gives me huge pleasure to welcome you today, wearing all of your many hats, whether that of Chairman of the Master Inholders, Managing Director of the Goring, um, or indeed any of the other um, many posts which you hold. Um, David, I've got a few questions up my sleeve, but perhaps you'd just like to start by giving us a little bit more of um, a flavour and a bit of colour of your career to date. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for, first of all, thank you for the invitation and for anybody who has actually taken the time and trouble uh, to actually log on, work out how to work Zoom and listen to the drivel, which I'm going to give you for the next few minutes. Um, <clears throat> I have always wanted to be in hotels and restaurants and my family have always wanted me not to be. Um, they, they felt like so many people still do actually that this is not a proper profession um, and I was supposed to be a barrister um, which would have been uh, much much more um, suitable and I think would have been much better for my parents to tell all their friends that I was a, a top barrister rather than a hotelier. Anyway they lost out and I got my way um, and it's been great uh, ever. I worked all uh, my holidays when I was at university and my gap year, I worked in a hotel down in Norwich called Sproston Hall, now called Sproston Manor. And I fell in love with it. In fact, I almost didn't go to university because they offered me what was then a very good job for someone my age. And I thought long and hard about not going to university. Very pleased I did, I had a great time at university, but I didn't get rid of the bug that I still wanted to be in hospitality. Um, and I think that 
30 years in one place is quite a long time. It's, it's almost unique if you don't own uh, the place and I don't own the place. Um, people think it's, <laughs> it's, it's a great achievement. I think what, they've reali what people don't realize is that nobody actually has offered me a good job anywhere else. Um, so it, it's been in my interests to stay um, but it appears to have been reasonably in the interests of the, of the Goring as well. So I, I, I moved to the Goring back in 1990. So I've literally last week had my 30th anniversary and what a terrible time to be having a 30th anniversary, really. Um, I went as restaurant manager. It was a very different place in those days, but its DNA was the same. It was all about guests. It had incredible staff. And it always sort of punched above its weight and, and we had a very good reputation within the industry uh, that George Goring had, had built up uh, with William Cowp, who was then the general manager. And yet it was very, very different to now. And having watched it develop over the last 30 years has been incredible. Um, much investment through George Goring. Then when Jeremy came along 16 years ago, uh, there was another um, investment in the property, investment in the staff, uh, but there wasn't really a change of direction. I suppose the only thing was luxury had changed in the London market and so we changed as well to make sure that we stayed in the luxury market because back in 1910 when the hotel opened it was very luxurious. It had a bathroom and central heating in every single room and no one else did at that point. They almost did in the cases of the Savoy and the Ritz but not quite. So we were very up to date and we were very luxurious. And we have made sure in the last 16 years that we have kept with that sector of the market that of course has grown and has moved ever more up market. And of course our clients and our colleagues, our staff do expect uh, very high standards from us. And uh, so it's been an incredible journey uh, it isn't quite over yet. I, I certainly don't have another 30 years left in me, um, but maybe a little bit longer. And um, so I'm delighted to still be there. I've been very lucky because the Goring have allowed me to do all of those other things you mentioned in your very kind introduction. Um, I, and I think it's very important if you stay in one place. And it, uh, you know, for those of you online who employ other people, if you want people to stay, give them the room to develop themselves in other ways. And when George Goring said, would I stay on when Jeremy came? I said, well, as long as I get on with him and he's got the same view as you did, George, which he has about guests and business, but also I need space to do other things. Otherwise I will become tired. Um, I will become stale and I will be of very little use to the business. And I think that if you're gonna have a long serving member of staff, especially at a senior level, give them a sabbatical from time to time, give them the opportunity to sit on other bodies and, and um, industry um, you know, establishments in order to try and ensure that you're getting the most out of them. And I, I like to feel that I've still got an energy uh, that I wouldn't have if that wasn't the case. I mean, there are many who would say I have no energy at all, uh, but I, I, I certainly have more than I would have had. There's a thought. Thank you, David. David, what, what would you describe as being the sort of the central strands of the DNA of the Goring Hotel? I think, first of all, family. It is family owned. And, and these days it is the last great family owned hotel um, in the luxury sector. I mean, they all they all were family owned. You know, uh, Mrs. Claridge owned Claridge's. There was, you know, Brown's was privately owned. Cesar Ritz owned the Ritz. Uh, Connell, which used to be called the Coburg, was owned by the Coburg family. We're the only one left. And back in 1910, all those owners would gather uh, once a month to have supper in the reunion de gastronome that still goes on. Um, but it was those people getting together and talking um, about what, what it was to be a hotelier in London, but they were all family members. So we're the only one left that is owned and run by a family. And that goes through all the DNA because the family's values are hospitality, hospitality, hospitality. Um, and what do I mean by that? I mean, I, I, uh, I'm asked to speak at, after lots of very smart dinners where we're all bedecked in black tie or white tie, diamonds, medals, whatever. And I always try and tell people that no matter what our places of work look like, all the marble, all the gold, whatever's there, 
ultimately we're just innkeepers uh, and you know we get we stand at the front door and we say to people you can't go home tonight um, either because you don't want to because you're on holiday or because you've got no option because you you're working come on in um, we'll give you something to eat we'll give you something to drink we'll give you a comfortable bed and we'll take care of your horse I mean that has never changed I mean that is still the fundamentals of what we're about but I think a lot of hoteliers and some hotel chains have forgotten that that is what we're about the Goring family hasn't and I think going through all the DNA is the, the, the requirement that we are hospitable to our guests. They also regard our staff as our greatest asset. I mean, we have a wonderful building and it's worth millions and millions and millions, but it is not the asset. The asset are the people who work in the building. And so the DNA is about caring what the guests wants and putting them first before um, just profit. And it's quite interesting because when I first arrived, I hadn't really quite got this and I came up with some fantastic ideas that I gave to George Goring about how we can make a bit more money and his question was always okay yeah that's great it's really good what about the guest is it going to enhance the guest experience or diminish it and early on I might have occasionally said well it may not be quite as good but I think it's gonna be really good for the business and his answer was always well then we'll we'll leave it and I think that that's it's those sort of things that go through our DNA Thank you very much, David. Um, <clears throat> in, in terms of the, the Goring Hotel as a business, could you, could you just outline what the key markets are of the hotel? Well, sort of anybody who's got the money and wants to come and stay is very welcome. Um, I remember once standing in the front hall before lunch one day greeting clients and a, a, a long-standing client came in just as a, a, a small, very luxurious coach um, turned up at the, at, at the Goring and some people got off it. And he looked at me and said, really? I thought the Goring wouldn't be the sort of place to take coach tours. And I said, well, we only do when they're millionaires. And, you know, there is a, there is a reality that what we supply and our mark, end of the market supplies is, 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 is expensive. We think it's good value, but it does cost money. Um, and I think that, you know, we've, we've made a decision that that's the, that's the part of the market we're going to be in. Um, I think that the way in which we run our business is, is to make sure that we have a, a reasonable balance of where our market comes from. However, we are very, very popular with the Americans because our style is very English. Uh, when we refurbished over the last 10, 15 years, we made a conscious decision not to go beige and go for that sort of modern look that so many of the other luxury hotels around town were doing. Uh, we wanted to stay with our roots and, and, and show a traditional English style. And we commissioned Gainsborough silks to make silks for the walls. We commissioned really good uh, cabinet makers that many hotels only use in their royal suite to make all the, all the cabinetry in, our, in the bedrooms. We made a decision that we wished to retain that very English, stylish, country house in London sort of look. Well, of course that really appeals to the Americans. So 50% of our business under normal circumstances is American. So of course we've been particularly badly hit by COVID um, as there, there are no international um, visitors, especially from America. About 30% of our business is from the UK and that's consistently been about 30%. And then we have 20% the rest of the world. And in that 20%, about seven or eight is Australasia. So it's, that's quite a big uh, market for us. So our mix in terms of business is probably just over 50% leisure and just over 50% uh, corporate. But corporate business at our level is very different. So it goes down as corporate business because the person is here on business, but they, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be that we've got a huge number of people all coming from one particular bank. We tend to really only have uh, the very top level, director level, and very, very senior management levels staying with us. But if they're there for work, they go down as corporate, and therefore 45% probably at the moment is corporate, but 55% is leisure. And David, without wishing to pry too much into the affairs of the business, just can you give us a bit of a fix in terms of what what uh, under normal market conditions um your sort of occupancies and and adrs are 
Yeah, I mean, our, our occupancy levels normally are in the high 80s. Um, that's, that's where we would expect to sit. Our ADR, ADR sits just above 500. Um, and, you know, we, we, we're a very small business. I mean, in 2016, when I took it over, we, we turned over, and it's a matter of public record it, 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 in the company's house, that we turned over about 6 million. Um, just over and um, last year we turned over nearly 18 million so we have changed the business whilst actually reducing the number of rooms uh, when I first started eight, uh, 30 years ago feels like 80 30 years ago uh, we had 86 bedrooms um, 16 years ago um, we had 76 I think it was and we now have 69 one of which is a two-bedroom suite so in reality 68 bedrooms so we've we've uh, made it more luxurious by uh, combining rooms, uh, but whilst making it much um, smaller really in, in, the, in the bed count, uh, we have managed to almost triple the, uh, the, the turnover of the business. So we would expect to be in the high 80s. I've no doubt the next question is going to be, well, where are you now? Um, and it is hovering around the 20% when we're open. Um, like, like most of the, of, of the hotels in London at the moment, the luxury market sits somewhere between 10% and 30%. Um, some, I, some of my colleagues tend to slightly exaggerate where they're sitting. Um, some are much more um, honest about it, um, but we are all in that sort of 20-ish percent mark rather than that 80 to 90 percent mark um, and of course uh, for the moment not much change and have you as a matter of interest managed to maintain your rate or has that slipped as well no the rate has gone up um, none of this um, none of this crisis is about costs of things um, so what we've actually found are the people who are still traveling want the very best rooms they can get so the rate has actually gone up um, and that's simply because it's the people at the higher level rooms who are the ones who feel able to travel. I don't know why. Um, so although we have got a very, very low um, occupancy level, uh, we have got a, a site, well, well, uh, well, quite a bit higher rate. Well, that at least is encouraging. And I mean, in terms of how you you've addressed the crisis, David, I mean, clearly we're, we're all living in uncharted waters and they they remain uncharted and you know the, the brexit situation just leads to even more uncertainty but how, how have you tackled managing your business through the crisis what what, what are the main steps you've taken well we, we we had just opened a second restaurant a while back siren with uh, nathan outlaw and we made a decision that when the market comes back and when we reopened in september there was no way we were going to be able to run two restaurants. I mean, we could hardly run one in the present circumstances, especially with all the opening and closing and all the restrictions. Um, so we made a decision, sadly, that, that for the moment that would ha have to not reopen. Um, but I suppose it's all about, first of all, being honest, uh, as honest as we can with ourselves about what the situation is. And I, my own view is err on the side of caution, not, not in this circumstance as optimism. I'm, I am by nature an optimist, but let's, let's be cautious when deciding how to run our business. Um, sadly, that has been probably the right way to do it. And so we've obviously tried to maintain costs and lower them in every way possible. Um, we have ended up with fewer staff. A lot of staff left in March. They wanted to go because we had a lot of, uh, staff from European countries and beyond, and they wanted to get home. And so uh, we said to them right at the beginning, look, if you don't feel you're loyal to us, if you want to get out before this thing uh, goes really bad, and this we were saying at the end of February, beginning of March, um, we'll, pay, we'll pay you um, for a few, few extra weeks just to let you get out and don't feel that you are um, beholden to us. And a lot of people did want to return to their families. So I think one of the interesting things is most of the, the luxury market in London is probably 40% fewer in numbers of staff uh, than they were on the 1st of January. Now, that isn't to say they've all made 40% of their staff redundant, but they haven't replaced um, any, any people who've left, haven't been replaced. 
uh, inevitably all the people who were on three month trials were not taken on at that, at, that uh, at the beginning of March. And so there has been a lot more natural wastage, no filling of empty places, people leaving to return to their homes, plus a certain amount of uh, redundancy has led to a, a fairly substantial drop in the number of um, people who are employed by the hotels. Having said that, most hotels, I think, are, are carrying more staff than they should be carrying if they were doing so purely on the business that they're, they're, they're doing at the moment. So everybody realises that our greatest asset is our staff, and we're all trying to maintain our staffing levels as high as we can afford to, um, and really supporting the staff who are having a really tough time. You know, we're open, we're closed, uh, they can do this, they can do that. You know, it, it's really difficult. And, and I, I and my senior team work, have worked all the way through on Zoom. Who knew what Zoom was before all this started? Um, but what's been interesting is to watch the ways in which they've had to deal with their own personal circumstances. If they've got young children who were not in school, if their wives or husbands are also working. Um, and so it's been quite interesting watching how people have had different challenges throughout this last few months. And of course, what we've tried to do is support everybody through those challenges in every way we possibly can. And I'm sure the whole of our market is doing the same in the luxury hotel market. Um, and, and do you think that the, the current crisis um, will lead to fundamental root and branch change? And I mean, looking, looking to the future, will you run the Goring differently to the way you've run it in the past? My, my own view is, uh, is that these things come and they go. I mean, I know that's not to underplay this extraordinary pandemic, which really, for, I suppose for our generation has been like fighting a major war in terms of how we've had to deal with it and the costs of it to the country and all the rest of it. Um, do I think things are gonna fundamentally change? No, I don't, because I think that what's gonna happen is people are gonna to want to return to normality. They want to return to what they had before. Um, you know, I don't subscribe to the view that offices in London are now dead. I think that there will be a move for some people who enjoy working at home. If they worked one day at home, they'll try and work two days at home probably. Um, you know, I think that some people who didn't ever work at home will work one, one, a day at home or whatever. But we're seeing that people are lacking the human contact of being together in their offices. We're seeing that companies are, are missing out on all that that brings, all the ideas that ping off people when they're having discussions, uh, that there's no doubt that a lot of people want to see a return to the normal way of working in cities, although I think there will, it will have moved home working a little bit further on, but I don't think it's going to have fundamentally changed everything, and I think that hotels and restaurants are not going to fundamentally change the way we do things. I think what it's made us do is look at the financials of our of our companies you know we've had in the in the hotel sector the luxury sector we've had several years of growth 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 and inevitably what we're trying to do is is uh, maximize um, our revenues but but also make sure that we are delivering fantastic um, services to our clients and and we probably got a little bit messy around the edges on cost control as always happens when things are going very very well this has made us all look at that. And I think that therefore um, there, there is some good to be taken from this when we return to some form of normality. I don't think we're gonna come back very quickly. My own view is that next year, the London market will probably be looking at sort of 40% occupancies rather than 80 or 90. And I think it'll take a couple of years to get back up to the normal uh, levels, by which time we will have quite a number of extra um, bed stock having come online, you know, the Peninsula will have opened and one or two other hotels that are in the pipeline. So um, by the time we get to the same numbers that we had in 2019, we will also have far more bed stock, which will put its extra pressures um, on, on our businesses. But I think that next year is going to be very challenging. Personally, I think the first quarter will be non-existent. But once we've got everybody um, vaccinated who is vulnerable, one would imagine that they will start to take restrictions off quite quickly. 
uh, because of course the restrictions are there to stop people being very ill and dying. They're not there to stop people getting flu-like symptoms if they're younger uh, and, less, uh, and less susceptible to, to um, this virus. So I, I, I personally think next year is gonna be very difficult, um, but I think it will come back May onwards. And overall, I'm hoping that we can touch the sort of 40% occupancy marks. But I, uh, you know, it, it, has it fundamentally changed who we are as hoteliers and what we deliver as hotels? I, I just don't see it. It'll sharpen us up. Okay. Well, there's nothing wrong with a bit of sharpening up, but not a very nice way to have to experience that or um, motivate it to make a sharpen up. Um, Without being <clears throat> too political, David, and, and today is, I guess, probably, uh, in a sense, a timely time to ask this question after the, the latest um, tier three imposition in London. But I'd be, I'd be interested to know what your views are as to how the government has actually handled the, um, the COVID crisis. I mean, I think this is very, a, a, a very interesting question and one that we all discuss around uh, our, our dining tables at home, I'm sure. The, the, the reality is, it, this is completely new to everybody. And of course, government made huge mistakes. Um, do I think any other government would have done better? I doubt it very much. And you only have to look across Europe to see that all the different methods that have been used are ending up in the same challenges. You know, so we were all saying Germany, we're doing it fantastically. Germany's now closed down for Christmas. You know, Germany, uh, has 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 had a different journey through this virus, but it still had a terribly difficult one, and one where mistakes have been made. And you know, I think our government, I think most of what our government has done has been understandable and has worked as well as anywhere else. Um, I think they need to learn from lessons, um, and I don't think they've always done that. I do have one challenge with the government and that is I think their communications have been appalling. Um, I think they have not communicated correctly um, and really simply and honestly to people and, you know, and, and have not treated people uh, as, as intelligent as they actually are. So I, I do have a view that they could have done much, much better with the way in which they've communicated things. I personally, from our industry, think that they've made a grave error in lumping us all together. As I said, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, luxury hotels are not the same as pubs full of young people in Soho. Uh, they are very, very different. And I think that they should have realized this and they should have nuanced some of the things that they've, they've done. Part of the, I mean, there's one good thing that's happened and that is that hospitality has come to the fore. People know what hospitality is now. They feel that hospitality has really been bashed. I mean, Kate Nichols and, and her team at UK Hospitality have done an amazing job of raising the profile. Now we're trying to push that forward. Um, there is at the moment, and, and anybody on the call who has not signed the petition, I would really ask you, please go. Uh, it, it's called Seat at the Table. You can find it on Instagram and it will lead you to the petition. We are trying to get um, as many signatories as possible to a petition requesting that our industry gets its own minister. Because at the moment, we are straddled as an industry between two departments, business and culture. And, you know, at no point really do we even feature in the titles of those departments. And yet, you know, we are the third biggest part of the economy. We have three million people we employ, another one and a half million employed directly because of us. And we put billions and billions and billions of tax revenue into the country uh, from VAT, from business rates, from, from everything that, that, that goes on. So we're all desperately uh, trying to build upon what, is, what has happened so far and see if we can get a minister for hospitality uh, to sit uh, higher in the, uh, at the tables of government, because I think had we had one, there would have been a greater understanding of our industry. And I think that some of the things that government would have been done might have been slightly differently nuanced. And, you know, had they decided, for instance, in London, that actually the likelihood of catching um, the virus uh, over this period now through till Christmas in 
a luxury hotel with all the precautions they've put in, uh, it, it just, it, it's not the same as, as vast parties going on with hundreds of people. It's very, very different. And so have they, have they done well? They could have done better, but then I think every country could have done better. I don't think any other party would have achieved, they'd have gone about it differently, but I doubt they'd have achieved a very different end. Uh, start communicating properly and learn from, from the lessons. Thank you, and David. I'm um, off David, very we're, soon. <laughs> <laughs> we're, uh, we're slightly running short of time, but um, we, we haven't even mentioned the master inholders, of which you are clearly um, the chairman. Um, and I, I wonder, just be before we, we um, draw to close, um, could you just uh, tell us a little bit about the master inholders and, and what the master inholders are doing under the current circumstances? Yeah. I mean, clearly it's a very august body with um, many of the leading hoteliers in the UK um, as members, many of whom are broadly in the independent sector. So it'd be interested, interesting to know what, what the MI's view of life is and what you're doing in that regard. Well, what, what the MI's are all about really is, is very basically, we're about maintaining the highest standards and promoting the highest standards, both of, uh, um, of our products, but also of our practices, especially with regard to our teams. Uh, we are also very uh, focused on education um, and be being a voice of, of our industry in the right areas. So supporting people like UK industry who are the lead voice uh, during this crisis. Um, now we have a couple of uh, educational schemes, MyAld, which is aimed at um, uh, the sort of uh, senior, um, uh, junior managers, as it were, and we have the scholarships that are uh, aimed at uh, the more senior managers. Now, both of those, unfortunately, have had to be put on hold. So we're just about to launch a new scheme, which will be all online and will be open to anybody um, who's interested. And we hope that this, this um, set of lectures and talks will help to retain people's interest in our in our industry if they've had to leave it, if they've been made redundant, um, but they still are interested and hopefully will come back to our industry when possible. So we've got a whole new uh, series of that going on. Our, our, um, our conference that we always have in uh, January, which is all about bringing our industry together and, and thinking through some of the challenges we face, can't take place, but we're going to do a virtual uh, set of lectures over a week in March. So basically we are communicating with each other much more than we would normally do to find out what's going on across the country. We are um, trying to put our weight behind um, the Hoteliers Charter that's going to be launched um, next year to try and ensure that we do much better with our staff. Um, we are putting our weight as well very much behind seat at the table to see if we can uh, get a minister for tourism so the inholders are doing everything they can um, during a very difficult time to bring our program our normal program of events uh, into this sort of zoom age in which we now live and so um, you know we you're right we have got some incredible minds uh, some incredible hoteliers in that group and uh, we want to make sure that uh, we're doing our bit uh, to support any initiatives that are going on that we think are correct. And we're lobbying Parliament, but we're doing it in a way alongside Kate Nichols, because one of the challenges we've had in our industry is too many voices. We've been too um, segmented. And when you are too segmented, it's very easy for government to ignore you. I mean, you know, if you're the National Union of Farmers, you don't get ignored because there's only one body that really represents you. And so we've seen that UK hospitality has grabbed the attention of the government. And so we're doing everything we can to support Kate in uh, Kate Nichols in all she's doing. David, thank you very, very much indeed. Um, please don't, don't go away. Um, there may be one or two questions, but um, uh, if I may, I'd like to um, now move to um, introduce Chris Tarrant. Um, Chris has become something of a, a regular on, on our weekly calls. Um, so Chris, it's very, very nice to welcome you back again. Um, I did a little bit of research um, 
on your on your business, Chris, and and I'm slightly embarrassed that I haven't given you more of a sort of um, flag waving introduction in the past because I didn't appreciate quite how large your business was. So, for the benefit of those on the call, um, I just want to give you a proper introduction, perhaps for the first time. Um, so, Chris founded BDRC Group the leading UK-based market research and advisory group in 1991. He shaped the strategy and led the growth of the firm to become a highly respected service provider with deep specialization in several service industry sectors, including hospitality and leisure. Its 170 staff are located in offices in London, Washington, DC, Singapore, Beijing, Jakarta, Sydney, and Cape Town, oh, and St. Albans. Um, in mid-2018, the French BVA Group became the majority shareholder in BDRC Group, creating a combined organization with close, close to 1,000 staff, revenues of over 185 million and 20 offices in 11 countries, which give it a very strong global presence. Um, Chris is highly experienced, an award-winning customer insight professional and outstanding reputation for pinpointing the business implications of research findings. He provides business advice that is sought out at CEO and board level. His extensive experience of global projects include much customer service and brand evaluation work for leading service industry clients, um, many in the hospitality and leisure sector. In 2014, Chris was appointed fellow of the Market Research Society, the highest accolade of the professional body for market researchers in the UK. Um, and helping clients to succeed by making better informed decisions is his business purpose. So, Chris, um, I'm sorry I didn't give you the, 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 the proper introduction that you, you merited in the past, but, but welcome again and thank you very much for once again sparing the time to join us. Um, and if I may, I will give you the floor. And uh, I'm guessing you might want to share your screen, um, so I'm letting you do that as well. Uh, Roddy, thank you very much and, uh, thank you for the introduction. I think what you've reminded me there is I need to make much more uh, a brief uh, how I describe myself on LinkedIn or anywhere like that. Uh, all I will say is, like David, I thoroughly enjoyed my time at Durham University, but, uh, but that would be a completely different uh, line to take. Um, <clears throat> so that, that's an awful lot of trumpet blowing, but uh, fortunately, most of the people on this uh, call have already heard me before. So uh, will know what it is they're going to receive next. Um, and uh, I last spoke to you actually only about five weeks ago, and I was pretty sombre and downbeat at that time. Uh, and I'm glad to say that um, I am going to be a little bit more positive uh, on this occasion. So I will share the screen with you because I'm going to share the latest consumer sentiment data that we have from our uh, tracking studies. And I'll just make sure I find the right piece. So, uh, Roddy, hopefully you'll get see your screen. Yeah, I'll put it on to um, full screen, which takes a while for it to warm up and do. Uh, can I check, do you have full screen or are you seeing partial screen? No, we're seeing part of the, the well, we, we can see your slide, but we've got the next slide showing as well, if that makes sense. How about this? Is that now just the full slide? That's perfect. That's perfect. Uh, all I know is I, I'm assuming some of the people uh, on this call are a bit like me, and it's quite nice having things in a fairly large type, uh, uh, so you can uh, read <laughs> them there. Um, so thank you very much indeed, Roddy, for inviting me back. Um, just a, a brief reminder for those uh, who may be new uh, to what I'm going to be sharing to you here. This is from a, a regular tracking program that uh, we have running. Um, and um, it's now managed ClearSight. Uh, my colleagues are just literally today producing uh, the, the December report is coming out today. And I've managed to include uh, some of that data uh, within the presentation. Most of it is from November, uh, but literally some of the data was still being collected up until yesterday. So this is consumer insight from a, a nationally representative um, survey of uh, adults in the UK. Um, and for this, we have support funding from the likes of Visit Britain, Visit Scotland and Visit Wales. I'm also on this occasion going to pull in a little bit more data from our business opinion omnibus, a monthly survey amongst uh, people in business. 
Uh, and for those who are familiar with the Lloyds Bank business barometer, it's actually, we do the work um, and they publish it. I mean, they obviously pay for it, which is why they put their name on it. Um, but um, it is the basis for the Lloyds Bank business barometer. And then we have some questions of our own as well. In the past, I've started with the national mood and sentiment, then looked at um, the impact of COVID-19 on the travel, leisure and hotel sectors. I'm going to flip the, that round this time because uh, the impact is very measurable and I'm sure many of you will have felt it uh, in your businesses as well. Uh, I then do want to be a little bit more forward looking, uh, which is what I'll get from the national mood and sentiment uh, element of these. So uh, we've been tracking what we said was recovery in the sector after uh, the initial wave, but obviously recovery has had a bit of a judder on it as it's closely aligned with the extent of uh, the perceived risk and also, of course, uh, government restrictions. Uh, so on this chart, looking at participation in particular leisure sectors across the UK population. So what you're looking at here is from January through to November, uh, when, some, when people said they last did any of these activities. So the, uh, the, the orange line is, I, I went to a restaurant. Um, and clearly there's a period of the year when all of these things were not allowed. So in April and May and into early June for a number of them, these things were not possible. We call this a recovery tracker for a while. And uh, clearly for something like restaurants, the eat out to help out in August uh, saw uh, levels of participation higher than being recorded pre-COVID in quarter one of this year. Um, so we saw a strong summer recovery. September wasn't too bad uh, for many of these sectors that I'm looking at here, uh, but things started to dampen down in October, which to a certain extent, there is a seasonal effect that one would anticipate. But I last presented to, to this group um, on about the 10th of November. Uh, at that time, we knew we were just getting the bite of the second uh, lockdown in England. There had already been the the circuit breaker uh, or the fire breaker in Wales and the tighter restrictions in Scotland. That clearly is demonstrated in this plummet in terms of the participation rates for these various activities, whether it's restaurant, pub, gym, outdoor attractions, even shopping trips uh, have dipped down during this period of time. So the impact of a lockdown on our behaviour is clearly most pronounced. In similar vein and similar analysis, looking at people who are making actual bookings uh, for holidays uh, and for um, any form of paid for accommodation. And we see a broadly similar pattern. Now, obviously in terms of making a booking, it was possible to do this during the first lockdown, not that too many people uh, were doing so. Uh, the purple line I've got here is, is booked any paid for accommodation. So that's not just hotels, it's also um, a, a rental Airbnb, um, self-catering cottages, any of those types of paid for accommodation. So we saw the summer uh, surge, um, getting up to reasonably good levels, but then the real throttle back um, uh, in November, in which actual booking an overseas holiday has flattened a little bit, but has stayed as strong as booking a UK holiday or booking paid for accommodation, which are at levels actually lower than we saw during lockdown one. Obviously lockdown one was in the spring when people were perhaps thinking of the summer. So there is a seasonal effect on top of the lockdown effect. But for our sector, there is no doubt the lockdown two has had a very profound effect. Something that we introduced in the webinar in uh, early November was looking at uh, what we're calling the comfort gap. Please mind the gap. Um, how comfortable does the population feel about staying away from home? And if you look on the left-hand part of this chart, uh, we look at staying in a hotel. Uh, we've got ratings before pre-COVID. 80% of people said, yes, they'd be comfortable about staying. Um, they'd be comfortable about doing that in the next month or so. In our most recent data, we're seeing that 44% are saying, yes, they, they would feel comfortable about doing it. This isn't saying they're going to do it. It's how do they feel about it? What is their perception uh, about uh, the acceptability of doing something like this? And so we're looking at the gap between the two of these as what we're calling the comfort gap. Uh, and clearly this does convey some of the challenge that the sector faces with regards to staying away from home. Uh, and while it's not that much larger, 
hotels do have somewhat more of a comfort gap uh, than other accommodation types. And I think much of this is to do with a perception that with some of these other accommodation types, I will not be mixing with other people. So I absolutely agree with what has been said by many people on these calls before. Hotels themselves have gone to fantastic, enormous steps to make sure that their environments are as COVID secure as they can make them. I think the guest's concern is less about the facility they're going to visit and more about the other guests uh, that they may meet there. And so it's the, the worry that there will just be too much interaction going on. On the right hand uh, part of the chart, we're now looking at has there been any change in this comfort gap over time? And we have to say so far, not much. So hotels are still at something of a disadvantage, these other accommodation types, uh, and, and, and there's no real discernible positive improvement. <clears throat> in fact, for some of them, uh, such as in self-catering accommodation um, or uh, in a, a private home, Airbnb or caravan campsite, they've actually weakened somewhat up to the data um, at the end of November. That's the somber news because that is demonstrating what the impact of lockdown two has been. What I want to do now is to move to an area that is at least a little bit more positive, looking at the mood of the nation. So when I last presented to you, I shared this chart um, and this has become a very good barometer as to what is the mood of the nation in which we're asking people um, yeah, regarding the situation of coronavirus in the UK and the way it's going to change in the coming month, which of the following best describes your opinion? So the red line, the worst is still to come. Amber, things are going to stay about the same. Green, the worst has passed. So five weeks ago, we were saying that consumers were distinctly downbeat. Three and five feared the worst was still to come. Few thought it had passed. We were in fact back to mid-April levels at the time of the peak in the first wave. So this really was uh, the most downbeat assessment uh, that I provided uh, to this group. The last time I presented was though, one day after the announcement of the Pfizer vaccine. And here's some encouraging news. So news of a viable vaccine, and clearly in the UK, vaccinations already are underway. This has led to the most dramatic improvement in UK consumer sentiment since April. And I say, even if, I think we can actually say when, there is a post-Christmas third wave, if you look at the data that is getting published on a daily basis, we already have an inflection in terms of the number of people being reported as having COVID. The third wave, I believe, has started. In spite of that, because of the vaccines now being available, there is a consumer perception that there is light at the end of the tunnel. So I say a dramatic change uh, between our waves uh, either side of the announcement of uh, the vaccine. So we're now down to one in three. It's still uh, clearly a very significant uh, proportion of the population. One in three is saying the worst is still to come. Approaching half feel that things are going to stay the same. And for the first time in months, we're seeing a, a significant increase in those who believe the worst has passed. It is still though only around one in five, one in four um, of all adults. So. We aren't yet back to where we were in early May in terms of consumer perceptions, when at that time, everyone thought it would all be over in a short period of time. What we do know is it won't be over by Christmas. The question is, will it be over by Easter? And I think here we have seen some encouraging news. The left-hand part of this chart is looking across all of the people we speak to, we ask people, Given what you know today, when do you think life will return to something close to normal? And the numbers here are the number of months on average across our total sample as to when we will return to normal. So back in early April, on average, people thought we'd be normal six months later. In other words, in October, which is well behind us. By the middle of the year, people's expectations had moved much further out. So by September, they were talking about actually it's going to take the best part of a year on average before things get better. What we're seeing is from the moment of the announcement of the, the vaccines becoming available, a significant drop in this average figure. So it's now down from 11 months off to around nine months off. Um, and if you look at the right-hand bars, the, this average is built out of the data in these right-hand bars. 
And I've got one bar that is mid-October. And uh, in uh, mid-October, we actually had 1% who thought it would all be over that month. Clearly, that month was not available when we were looking uh, in November. There are still a few optimists who believe it's going to be over soon. But the big shift is in those who believe that by quarter two of next year, which ties in very closely with what David was saying, by quarter two of next year, a significant increase in the proportion who now believe life will return to something close to normal. And so that takes us up to around about half of the population believe that by the end of quarter two, we will be back to something close to normal. So that at least is some positive encouragement looking ahead. Consumer sentiment has moved strongly positive over the last five weeks. And a, a question we've asked in terms of when a vaccine becomes available, how will people respond? And overall, three and four so that have the vaccination either straight away, that's 42% saying that. Um, some people slightly more cautious, I'll wait a month or two to ensure there are no side effects. Clearly, many of us will have to wait more than a month or two before we're even offered the vaccination. But if you take those uh, two categories, three and four are indicating that they will be up for the vaccination, which should bode well uh, for the population reaching herd immunity. Um, and if you look at the right-hand end, uh, they may be a vocal group, but vaccine deniers are a relatively small minority. Um, 7% saying I don't trust vaccines, so I'll not have one. Uh, next to them, uh, perhaps a sort of the MMR type situation. You know, I may not bother as if enough other people have the vaccine, then COVID will decline anyway, which of course is correct, uh, but doesn't help a mass vaccination program. Um, it, we're definitely seeing for those in the older age categories, they will go for the vaccination as soon as they can get it. In fact, over two thirds of those aged above 65 say that, and over half of those aged 55 to 64. Um, and I think that might include the demographic of some of the people on this call. Uh, the young, uh, the, the group saying, I'll only get the vaccine if it's necessary for certain activities, they spike somewhat higher in that category, which if it means they can travel somewhere, then they would go for the vaccine. But overall, a positive response to uh, the vaccination program. I'm going to then wrap up just with a view of the uh, UK businesses. And here again, we're seeing a strong shift in opinion. Uh, this is data that is collected up until the 10th of December. We'd actually say business leaders are now even more optimistic than consumers that this may truly be the beginning of the end. I think if we look back at uh, early May, that was merely the end of the beginning. Uh, but uh, the fact that they can now start to plan ahead, I think is going to have a really positive impact on business. So this may be a preliminary driver to some corporate demand coming back into the market, in which if businesses can start to plan, make their plans for 2021 with the notion that they'll have people back in the office, they'll be able to make some travel again. Um, it does show there is opportunity here. And for those who have not yet registered on our clear site uh, archive and library, I recommend you do so as there is an entire um, set of slides there that is linked to um, the future prospects for the business travel market um, with data uh, up till November. So it will, it will in fact have got more positive uh, since uh, that report was produced. But that gives some indication as to when corporate demand will start to come back into the market. Uh, a question about the UK's government's handling of the crisis. Well, it has recovered a little um, in November amongst British businesses. Those not confident, uh, the net not confident position has only gone down slightly. So we've got people moving out of the I don't really know camp. And I suspect here, confidence in the government is going to be heavily influenced by the efficiency with which the vaccination program uh, is carried out. And I fully agree with the comments being made about the problems uh, with communication. Uh, but here, if we can start having measures as to how many people have been vaccinated, that's a metric which I think would give confidence to people. And I've not heard any mention of that yet. On the right hand side, we're saying even for those businesses in our sample, and to the point that it is a major part of the economy, this is around about one third of our sample, those in the leisure, hospitality and art sectors, even here, confidence in the government has improved uh, over the last three waves of data collection. Um, and I'm sure that's been influenced uh, by the positivity around the rollout of vaccinations. So it's looking more positive on the COVID front. 
I am, though, now going to have one slide on the other elephant uh, that is actually sitting in the corner of the room and we haven't noticed until quite recently. And this is talking to businesses about what do they think poses the bigger threat to their business. And at the moment, half say that COVID is the biggest threat to their business. Uh, but around a quarter say COVID and Brexit is an equal threat. Um, and around one in seven saying Brexit is actually more significant to them uh, than COVID. And if we take those two categories of an equal threat or Brexit, in other words, where Brexit is one of the major concerns, um, for over half of businesses with a turnover above £5 million, that comes through as their bigger concern now. Um, and I would say, we, literally, I got this data yesterday, um, and we, we are, have asked a whole series of additional questions about how prepared business feels it is for Brexit. And I don't have the data, but I have just scanned through it. And I think it will not surprise you to know an awful lot of British business feel it is not well prepared, it has not been sufficiently well informed, and it doesn't even know what Brexit is going to look like. But thank you all very much, and I hope that um, is a useful uh, uh, uptake in terms of uh, where we're at in terms of uh, consumer sentiment at this moment in time. Chris, very many thanks indeed, um, as ever, insightful to the point and, and um, extremely interesting and, and helpful and, and indeed a little more encouraging. Um, but perhaps I can just, and, and, and very timely, thank you very much for squeezing in. Um, could I just ask a, a sort of question at a more practical level? I mean, clearly you're dealing with uh, clients in the hospitality and leisure sector. Uh, and those people that you're actually dealing with directly, what sort of sentiment looking forward? Are, are people reasonably optimistic or are they still very cautious and very being very prudent? Um, I have to be absolutely honest with you, Roddy, and say that our consultancy work in the hospitality sector is at a fraction of what it normally is. Uh, so we're doing very, very little work. Um, we have one or two, we, we have some regular tracking programs that we do in the meetings and events space, um, looking at um, how people are handling uh, meetings inquiries. That is just beginning to be reactivated. We're normally collecting data for people on a monthly basis. That program has been on hold for nine months. Uh, we just have uh, some of our clients are beginning to come back. So I suppose that's an indication that um, there is a recognition that there is going to be a market of opportunity out there. Um, and it's one of the reasons, you know, we've been doing the sort of work we're describing for you here is trying to understand what business sentiment is so that we can provide that information to our clients. Um, and um, we are looking, uh, I didn't share the chart today, but in terms of travel for business, um, uh, from our November data collection, I think about 85% of businesses expect to be back to normal by the end of next year. Um, so uh, David's point about there will be a return to normality. We think that will happen. We think the meetings and events space will be um, significantly, um, the, the consensus amongst our clients is that will never recover to the level it was. Uh, therefore, we have been collecting information, for example, on hybrid uh, products. So I think that it is a time for product innovation uh, in the sector. Um, so we are speaking to clients about hybrid products in which some people are in the meeting, some people join it virtually or part of a meeting is in, uh, is in person. Um, and clearly we are, we are seeing people making um, their hotels and venues appropriate as places for enhanced remote working. And again, I didn't show the data, but when we asked that of business leaders, 65% thought it was uh, an interesting idea and 22% said it was a very interesting idea as far as their staff were concerned. So that's in indicating potentially a very large market of enhanced remote working. Um, with that, you clearly need to get the offer right. Uh, but I think that once we're past a stage in which we're having to enforce social distancing uh, rigidly, an important component of hospitality, you actually need guests. They are part of the ingredient that makes hospitality work. Um, so getting people back into venues, even if they're just there as remote workers, making a relatively small contribution uh, to your revenue, it will give a buzz to a place. And I think that's, I say, an important component of, of what makes this um, business uh, and sector what it is. That's a roundabout way uh, uh, of answering it. There, we, we're seeing some green shoots 
of encouragement, but it has been very quiet for a very long time. Chris, thank you very much indeed. Um, as ever, as I say, very insightful and, and judging by the comments in the chat box, um, people have very much enjoyed listening to you as indeed they have to you, David. David, thank you very, very much indeed for sparing the time to, to join us today. Um, I'm sure we all join in, in wishing you and your team at the Goring the, um, the very best for 2021 and, and may it be slightly brighter than perhaps we're all fearing. Um, uh, buoyed by some of Chris's slightly better news um, about consumer sentiment, you know, hopefully the consumers are right and hopefully the vaccine does indeed herald um, brighter days ahead. Um, so uh, thank you very much to you both. Sorry, can I just say thank you very much for having me. I'm going to have to jump off the call because I've now got a, an ex-co call at the Goring to decide what we're going to do about the hotel. But just if I may say thank you very much for having me and two other things. First, please, uh, a seat at the table, uh, have a look at it. And if you can sign that petition and more importantly, if you feel strongly that you do agree with that as a petition, that you share it. Uh, amongst your your own contacts, whether they be suppliers, people you work with, or just friends, I would be really, really grateful. Our industry, as you know, needs all the help it can possibly get. Um, and also, if you do find that uh, once we're allowed to eat again uh, or stay in hotels, uh, our doors are always open. Do come spend your money with us. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, David. I'm glad you managed to get the promotional in and, and do and I, I endorse exactly what you're saying about the table and, and it's lovely to see it's over 100,000, but we need more and more signatures, so any support welcome. Um, next week we have a, a group panel session, um, so we'll look forward to seeing um, as many of you as, you, uh, as can make it. Um, please bring your party hats because there'll be a little bit of... Um, Christmas cheer, I'm sure. Um, but uh, until next week, thank you again to Chris. Thank you very much again to David. And uh, look after yourselves and have a good week. Uh, all the very best to you. Take care. Thanks again, Ollie. See you next week. Bye. Pleasure, Thanks, Charles. Ollie. Look forward to it. All the best. Thank you very much, Chris. Very much appreciated. Pleasure. Thank you, Ronnie. Great pleasure. L Laura, I was trying to work out what you were telling me. Oh, you've gone there. Mr. Seymour, how are you? I'm very well, sir. How are you? Very well. I'm just going to stop the recording. Um, yeah.